Okay, uh, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Marcus Carey, uh, and I, I'm the community manager, and I do security research at Rapid7. And uh, I, a couple months ago, I started playing around, actually trying to write stuff. Uh, and this was before I joined Rapid7. I've been in Rapid7 like six months or something now. Before I started with Rapid7, I started trying to be able to test uh, network uh, infrastructure devices. And then I got to Rapid7 uh, as a community manager, and uh, I just started to, I kept on trying to do uh, some of the stuff I was doing before. And since we uh, do Metasploit at Rapid7, I started adding stuff to, uh, to Metasploit. Uh, real quick background, uh, I, I was a former U.S. Navy. I've been all over the world. I was a CT in the Navy. And I uh, learned a lot of cool stuff there. Thanks, all those CTs out there. All those ex-Navy guys out there. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my, my teammates. These guys also work for Rapid7. Uh, real quick, I'm going to let them introduce themselves real quick. Uh, my name is David Rood. Um, I'm the exploit developer for Metasploit. Uh, basically, I'm in charge of pretty much every single module that goes into Metasploit. I have to do code review of everything. Um, and my past experience, uh, I've been working in exploit dev probably for five or six years at least. Uh, prior to Metasploit, I worked for iDefense doing a lot of uh, zero day validation and stuff like that, so. I'm Will, uh, I'm a pen tester at Rapid7, been there about three years. Uh, do all sorts of pen testing, anything from Network pen tests, web app pen tests. I did talk on DDoSing, so we've done a little bit of that. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Okay, uh, real quick. So what I'm, what I'm going to uh, do today, everything hopefully will be in the trunk within the next 24 hours. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at, what, what I'm going to do real quick is going to go a, a quick little outline. I know everybody in here may not know what Metasploit is. There's a lot of people that do. So. Uh, be patient with me if I'm uh, going to uh, start off a little bit, bit slow here. But in the end, we're going to have uh, live demos. We're going to walk through some code on how, how we did this. And uh, we're going to talk about from a pen tester's perspective. Here's the actual outline. And uh, we're going to just uh, hopefully we'll have fun. Hopefully you'll learn something. And uh, after the talk, we'll, I'll be over there in the speaker lines uh, for anybody that wants to beat me up or anything like that or ask questions. Uh, real quick, Metasploit uh, framework, the, the Metasploit project was uh, founded in uh, 2003 uh, by H.D. Moore, who is the CSO of uh, uh, Rapid7 now. And so basically, uh, we, we actually, uh, we kind of, it kind of reminds me of the kind of like the SourceFire story, how SourceFire started up with an open source tool, and, and then we, uh, we uh, Metasploit got picked up by, by uh, Rapid7, I'm stuttering like a mug up here. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, the Metasploit framework is still open source, uh, BSD license, and a lot, of, a lot of other commercial people use it. We use it in, in uh, commercial use, uh, and we, use, we have Metasploit Express and Metasploit Pro. But everything here I'm going to talk about is going to be available in a Metasploit framework. Uh, and, and it's my intent, and I'm kind of like a giving community guy. A lot of people know me. So my whole purpose of doing this is trying to help organizations out. I come from a military background, government background, so I've always wanted to help people uh, secure uh, their systems and such. All right, a uh, little bit about the Metaf Metasploit framework architecture. And uh, this slide right here, I'm not going to read, read the slides to you, but basically there's a lot of things in Metasploit framework, and, and these slides will be available afterwards, of course. Uh, the thing we want to uh, concentrate on here is modules, and, uh, some, and we use uh, a combination of these modules to actually do, uh, to, and actually most of this stuff has been used a long time just primarily for uh, network exploitation. Uh, and I came to the Metasploit team from a defensive background, so my whole thing was like, uh, I want to actually help people defend networks and actually test their network infrastructure instead of just trying to exploit in-host. And so here, uh, all these modules play some part in, in Vsploit and, and Metasploit over as a whole. In particular, we're talking about auxiliary modules, and in the end, 
when, when Dave comes up, he's going to talk about how anybody can contribute uh, to do vSploit modules. And far as uh, Metasploit development goes, if you want to actually start doing stuff that helps the community out, this is a, a really, really low threshold to actually start doing Metasploit development. So the whole point of this, uh, I've deployed uh, enterprise IDSs. I've built networks at g large government places. I've did all kind of defensive stuff. And, uh, and, and sometimes you want to actually test to see if stuff's working, but you don't want to use live exploits. And uh, a lot of people are concerned about running exploits on their network. A lot of people are adverse to that, and I, and I definitely understand. So the vSploit thing is like doing paintball. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't knock anything over. Uh, and I can't say anything is 100% uh, you know, flawless. But in, a, in an ideal situation, we, we've had discussions even this morning where we're talking about there could be a possibility to start sending stuff and IPS may shut, shut a connection down if you have it in active mode, you know, if, if you send it stuff that looks like exploitation or uh, attack responses. So basically what I'm trying to do is it's a, really a new spin on auxiliary modules. Again, uh, I'm not really trying to exploit anything. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a nice guy. I'm, I made, some people say I look like Mr. T or Kimball Slice or something. But I'm a, I'm, I'm a very nice guy. Uh, I'm scared of the mountains. It sucked. I actually drove here from Maryland. Uh, it was a four day drive. That was crazy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, man, I, I hate the mountains. I'm telling you. Okay, uh, again, uh, the purpose of the whole vSploit thing is to actually evaluate devices on their own merit. Now, what I'm saying is on their own merit, I, I don't want to evade anything. I want to try to be able to test devices exactly as they say. They, I want to see if things do what they, uh, they do. I mean, there's a funny commercial where Dennis Green is saying, uh, he, it's a funny uh, American uh, beer commercial. Uh, I want to see if the device set is what it says it is, pretty much. And I... Uh, so uh, I don't want to do any kind of traffic evasion. Uh, the main thing is I want to ensure proper network device placement because there's a lot of different networks where people don't even understand their own infrastructure, so it's absolutely impossible for them to place a device like an IDS or IPS or DLP because they just don't know the layout of their own network. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, really true. And even if a consultant came in, say in, in a consultant comes in, they want to actually deploy IDSs on someone's network, half the time the people that they're supposed to help them, they're, they don't know where to place the devices on their network anyway. So this is an attempt for people, in-house security people, to be able to test out stuff, send these things to trigger alerts, and if it's not triggering alerts, you know that you have your devices placed in the wrong place. So it, it's also an opportunity to train security staff. And, um, and I, I'm going to talk about this now. One of the things that I actually uh, wrote that didn't make it here, and uh, Dave said because I suck at writing code, it didn't make it into the trunk yet. But uh, I've actually, I actually wrote a scheduling uh, function into Metasploit, and it'll be in there pretty soon, where you can actually schedule exploitation to happen. So you can say, I want an exploit to happen at 2 o'clock on a Saturday night. And it could be an exploit or it could be a vSploit module. So that'll be in Metasploit pretty quick. Didn't make it for this talk. But the thing is, like, if you have a, if you have a managed security provider, MSSP or whatever they call it, um, or just your regular knock or S knock or whatever you want to call it, you want to know if they're actually watching things at 3 or 4 in the morning. So uh, the ability to actually schedule exploitation and to actually schedule exploits is going to be in Metasploit very, very soon. If I could code better, be in there today for this demo. But I actually had it working, but, but uh, HD said my code sucked. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right, so really, really, uh, the real important thing here is like, you know, in, in, in uh, the whole AV world, you have the eCar file where you can actually drop it and it alerts. Well, there's not a really good test case for network based traffic. And so one of the big things is the last bullet is, is good test cases are hard to emulate. I've tested out big enterprise IDS systems. I've tested out DLP solutions at major government customers. And, and even sometimes the vendors don't have a really easy way for people to test out stuff. Uh, with DLP, sometimes they have files that look like DLP 
for, for the host side, but it's kind of hard to generate traffic in, in any kind of uh, way to, to actually point it towards something and send stuff that should trip those alerts. So some of the things I'm talking about testing here is IDSs, IPSs, DLP stuff, uh, firewalls, and uh, basically net flow collection, all these different things. And it's, again, it's just to be able to test, educate, and be able to respond to things. So what I'm calling interesting traffic, I, come, I used to do a lot of network engineering and we had this term, uh, it's probably a Cisco term, inter interesting traffic or, so basically what you wanna do from, from a client, uh, and this is one of the things that, um, that, that you can do from a web browser or, or many other things. So, so you have Metasploit Framework on one side, you have a web browser on one side, and you can actually do requests, and then Metasploit Framework is gonna send you data that looks like PII or whatever other kind of traffic. Also, another big thing that, we, that, I, that I tried to do, and this was like dead simple. So some of the things I'm talking about is not gonna be rocket science, but it works really well, right? Basically, do, being able to do DNS uh, queries over, over different times, and actually when the scheduling piece works, we're gonna be able to emulate uh, malware uh, at, scheduled, at scheduled times on your network. So uh, real quick, IDS and IPSs are, are mostly signature-based in, in, uh, in most organizations run signature-based IDSs, looks for known traffic. So if it looks for known traffic, we just have to know what, what it's looking for and we can actually uh, emulate that traffic in a, in, a, in a controlled way without actually popping boxes. It, we, can emulate, uh, we can emulate SQL injections, we can emulate attack responses and other kind of suspicious behavior. Uh, and IDSs should be able to catch all that stuff. So uh, DLP, in, in, in my opinion, that, I mean, even some IDSs have a DLP type functionality where you can put in uh, social security, regular expressions, and all kind of other things. Uh, most of them are concerned with PII. Since all these data breaches are occurring lately, a lot, it's a big market for uh, DLP solutions now. And, uh, and I tell you, some, it's, it's good to know if you make a million dollar investment, if that actual investment is actually paying off. And, and many times people can't actually validate if their stuff works. So the ideal situation is this. If you're gonna to try to go out and procure stuff, you would wanna use something like Vsploit to actually test to see if those things work. As they say they work. If they say they catch credit cards, test it with credit cards. Uh, socials, whatever you're trying to do. Medical information. And, and a real important piece is to be able to customly craft traffic, and, uh, and Dave's gonna be talking about it, Custom, be able to actually write your own Vsplay modules to meet your environment. If you're a government person, if you're a bank, there's all kind of different ways to actually, to uh, a need to actually have the, the ability to generate traffic that's relevant to your environment. Okay, and also, this is a big thing here. Sims are, are big, and there's a million different definitions for Sims. I think this is the latest, uh, uh, this is kind of like the latest one I see a lot of analysts using. So I'm rolling with that, right? So basically they collect system, system logs, but one of the things that, that a lot of people have is they may have all these devices uh, you know, dispersed all over the network, and I, and I have really good friends that, that do large deployments of, of SIMs, and many times IDSs aren't even, call, aren't even uh, sending data to the SIM. This is a good way to like, all right, send data to all, all over my network, put in IP address range, send the data, or is my SIM seeing, seeing this traffic? Basically to test your SIMs to see if they're, they're uh, logging that network-based traffic from your DLPs, your IPSs, and all that stuff. So basically, uh, here, here's what I did, and I, hope, I apologize for people at the far back, because this is probably not that good, but once, I'm gonna do a demo, and so when you see the demo, you'll see it much better. So basically, I created a PI, PII module, and what the PI, PII module does is it actually just generates web traffic that you can, do, you can actually connect to it uh, with your browser, and I have it refreshing, so you, you have an option where it refreshes, and generally, what, generally speaking, it, it generates a thousand lines of PII data, and I even, I even built a loan check in it to actually generate real looking credit card numbers because some devices are smart enough to like do a loan check and, and so basically this would look like if you place it in the right place in your network, it would look like credit cards or SSNs are leaking. 
And also, you have the capability to generate any kind of other traffic that you want to tr trigger. It meets a lot of criteria of different devices like DLP and, and IDSs because it generates a three-way handshake and you're pulling data across the network. And that was a big, big challenge, uh, but it's easy to do with Metasploit Framework to, to be able to generate these things. So this web server module is typically used for stuff like DB, uh, well, well, browser autopone and other kind of uh, things in Metasploit, but I'm using everything for a totally different purpose than it is. I'm trying to use Metasploit more for good than evil. Okay, uh, also, uh, you can, have, I, I did all kind, I played around with all kind of stuff. I, I basically created a module that actually lets you download, uh, randomly download stuff. Metasploit hosts that and sends, and sends files. Harmless stuff. Uh, the web beaconing, uh, and I actually have, and I, 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 I think I might have changed the name of this to web querying, but uh, actually when I got to Vegas after four days of travel, my, my Windows 7 laptop was totally blue screened, and I lost everything. So this is actually like a, a, a good attempt of making good on a presentation. So uh, the web beaconing simply is, I, I, in a lot of government organizations, uh, I see it time and time again that like someone like US CERT or some outside third party has to notify a government agency that they've been compromised and are beaconing to China or what, whatever it may be. Uh, they, they've been affected with Zeus or I mean any other, any other kind of malware and it happens all the time. And what's funny about that is even though people may block that, that traffic, I, also, I often wonder, like, why didn't the organization see that traffic first? And, and so, one of the things I, I, one of the things I think this is one of the most important things that I that I've been doing is playing around with this this web beaconing and actually doing more doing research on the different types of malware and botnets and actually allowing people to upload their own list of DNS entries uh, to actually uh, test this out. And what's cool about it, I, I'm actually a, kind of a packet junkie still. So I, did, I do Wireshark captures to make sure that everything is really happening. So basically the, the scenario would be this. You, you set Metasploit on your network on a different, on any kind of VLAN, and, and just to test your network, just put it on your network and start doing these malicious queries. Uh, you know, I have Zeus, Mariposa, and, and, a, and also the ability to do anything you want. I mean, people are looking for different signatures, and it actually can, can you can iterate this over a, a, a number of times. Also, vulnerable headers. Uh, there's several vendors that actually do like passive vulnerability scanning, like uh, Tenable, uh, Sourcefire actually actually can monitor. I think they have they have a product called RNA, which is does it actually sees what kind of uh, devices you have in your network. And so sometimes people don't know. So so one of these, this vulnerable header thing, what I did is I took a list of vulnerable headers, right, and I was like just drop these on the network to see if anybody's paying attention. So if you have an IS4 or 5 server on your network that pops up and you don't know it, I mean, I mean, do you have the ability to even see that? So these are the kind of things I'm talking about testing. And so here's a PCAP of the actual, uh, and, and you can probably see uh, over there, if you can't see it, that it's, it's, it's an old vulnerable header. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to uh, Dave real quick, and he's gonna be talking about uh, Writing uh, Vsploit modules for a second. So, uh, can I get a quick show of hands of how many people have actually written a module for Metasploit? Okay, so not too many of you. All right. Um, this is just going to be like a really quick overview of uh, some of the features and uh, some of the, you know, like the ways of developing a module for, for Metasploit. Um, first of all, Metasploit is written in, in Ruby, so if you're going to write a module for Ruby or for Metasploit, it's really good to know Ruby. And um, here's a few links, uh, and there's uh, some book titles on there. Uh, the slides will be available like, after the talk, so you can go back and look at them then. So Metasploit has a whole bunch of support for just about everything you can imagine. Um, a lot of it originated for like a need for uh, protocol support and all kinds of other kind of support that we needed for exploit development and post-exploit 
post exploitation and auxiliary modules and everything like that. So we have pretty much anything you can think of in there. Um, and this comes in really handy when you're developing a module because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there for you. And um, this is just a few of the, the mix-ins that we have. And um, what, what a mix-in is, is basically like a library that you can include into your module and just call methods out of it. Um, and we have HTTP server, uh, client, we have a scanner module and uh, SMTP uh, modules. So we have a lot of functionality in there and there's many, many more in there. You just have to look at the code and kind of dig in. Oh. All right, so I'm going to actually give you guys a little view of some code. So one of the modules that Marcus was just talking about is the web PII module. And basically what it does is it sets up a web server and it dumps a whole lot of uh, data that looks like personal information. And the hopes is that uh, DLP devices on your network will catch that stuff. So first of all, every module in Metasploit starts with this base class, Metasploit 3. Um, now we're on uh, Metasploit 4, which just came out August 1st. Um, so uh, that class name is going to be changing to Metasploit 4. And with each module, you inherit the type of module that you're going to be writing, which is the MSF auxiliary in this case. And right here with uh, the include, this is actually the mixins. Both of these are mixins. We we actually wrote um, the PII mixin today, and um, what that does is generate all that PII data for you. So you can write any module you want. If you want that module to to um, you know exfiltrate PII information, you can do that. Just include this this mixin, and it's there for you. All the generating code is there, so you don't have to sit there and try to generate and match you know, any kind of format for the PII. It's already there and done for you. And then we have the, um, the initialize for the class itself. Each module is a class. And this right here, this is the information structure. So this this gives all the information to the users about what your module does, what the name of the module is, um, who wrote the module, uh, what revision number you're actually on when the module, like when it was last updated. Um, and you can also include like references um, for anything that you write. If you find information out on the web and you think other people are going to find it useful, you can add those references into your module. And anyone who views your code can see that mod that uh, references. There's a lot of other things. It gets a little bit more complicated. Um, like you have default options, and you can register options that you want for your module. So when someone is using your module, they have to configure it. Um, they need a you know. In this case, we're using Meta Refresh as one of the options. So you can tell the module whether or not you want to auto refresh the web page with the PII data that it's dropping. Um, and you can also change the amount of time and the, the number of PII entries that's generated. So this is just a function that Marcus wrote called create page and it has uh, this really awesome uh, ASCII sheep. <laughs> I love the ASCII sheep. Greatest accomplishment. <laughs> it is your greatest accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and um, so right here, he's actually building up the HTML of the the web page that he's dropping, and you can see here he does a little check for the meta refresh option. 
So when you're actually writing a module and you want to you want to get the information that the user configured, you access it through the data store. Everything is stored in the data store whenever there's an option um, that a user can set. So as long as you know the name of the option, you can get the information out of that. It's just like a, a variable. So yeah, here he's just setting up the HTML. He's doing some more checking on some options. And right here we're using the mixin, the, the PII mixin that we wrote today to actually generate the, the PII data. And that's what this create PII call right here is. And that's actually what generates everything for you. And um, that will put the PII data on the page right here. Okay. And then this on request URI function, that's actually an overloaded function from the, um, the HTTP server uh, mix in. So what happens is when a request for your web server um, comes in, this function is what's called. And you have the CLI and the request uh, variables that are passed to the function. And that can give you um, detailed information about what the request was, where it came from, a um, whole lot of information about the client, uh, user agent, everything. And everything that you could uh, think of is in there in terms of a, a web request that would be coming your way. So right here is where he's calling that create page function that we went over. And this is the function that builds the page and has the awesome ASCII sheet that I love. And uh, right here, the send response function. This is also uh, part of the HTTP server mix-in. Um, so you can just call this directly. You don't have to do any kind of strange namespace convention or anything like that because you've already done it with the include. And this will just send the response to the client. And right here is the run function. And um, whenever you're writing a, an auxiliary module, uh, to actually run the module, the command is run. So the initial starting point of the module starts in the run function. So it's pretty simple. Um, so that's just one of the modules that we did. Um, now I'll give you guys a quick look at the uh, PII uh, mix-in that we wrote today. And this is the one that generates everything for you. So mix-ins are a little bit different. Um, they're not really like a module. They're just something that you can include. It's a library that you include into your module and use the functionality of that library. So this is just um, this defining the namespace of the library itself. So it starts off with MSF and then down here you define that it's an auxiliary module and finally that the uh, namespace should end with PII which is the, the name of the mixin. And down here you have the initialize function, which is actually um, sort of uh, an override of the auxiliary modules initialize. Um, and this is what will set up uh, options for that particular mixin. So the, mo the module itself, the auxiliary module, will inherit these options. So you'll have um, an entries option and an email domain option within the module if you include this. Okay, so here's some uh, awesome Marcus code right here. <laughs> I always pick on Marcus, but he's a really cool guy. I like Marcus. <laughs> All right, so um, Right here he's doing uh, some code to create something that looks like a, I don't know, what are you trying to create here? <laughs> All right. So some function that looks like it's creating an account number of some kind. And here we have a, some, a function that's creating social security numbers. 
and date of birth, passwords, uh, some other stuff. Here's some like general PII stuff, first names, last names, that kind of stuff. And here he's just checking the options to see how many entries to generate. And then everything returns back to the module that's using this. So it's pretty easy stuff. Um, another thing I wanted to show you guys is uh, some of the support that we have in Metasploit for some really interesting like string manipulation and uh, randomization. Um, mostly it's used in like exploit dev situations, but um, it could be useful in any kind of module I, I imagine. So we have all kinds of stuff in here. We have an array of all the states, uh, upper, alpha, lower, all that stuff. We can do, um, let's see, JavaScript comments. We can convert a string to JavaScript comments, to Perl, to Java, UTF-8. Okay. All right, so just showing you that real quick. All right. So we'll move on now. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, real, real quick, uh, Will's going to come up and he's going to talk about how people can use this from a pen tester's perspective. <coughs> right, so when I was brainstorming with Marcus, I was starting to talk about things that I just can't do on a pen test or are bad ideas. So one thing I'm not going to want to do is install malware on the corporate domain. I mean, the obviously terrible idea. Uh, two, exfiltrating real PII data that puts me in a bad position and it's bad for the customer I'm working with. Um, and then exploiting critical servers or systems. So I mean, depending on the scope of the engagement or what the goals are, there's certain servers that I'm just not going to want to attack because they're so business critical that if they went down, that could be a major issue. Um, but there still are things that we can test for as part of those. So egress ports are one. So if we're, if we're modeling sort of the malware, um, we want to test what the command and control can go back out on. So if I'm on the corporate domain, I can begin to test using vSploit, test all of my outbound connections, and then I know how I can make outbound connections. Um, resolving blacklisted domains is another one. Uh, so I don't need to drop malware to do it. I can use vSploit to test these sorts of things. Um, sending known IDS signatures, so that's another one that's in there. And, th and that can also help on the pen test because then I can know what I might be able to get through uh, if I was attacking, if it was an IPS rather than IDS. Uh, so we can send sets of rules, see how it behaves. Uh, and then exfiltrating simulated PII or other data. So rather than actually sending customer PII data, so the credit card numbers, I can send the simulated ones. And I can, the other thing is I can do is I can sit with my client and I can say, is your network operations team test catching this? Or we can do it with the scheduled part. We can do it at 2 a.m. One, did it get caught? And two, did you see the anomalous usage at that hour? So there's really good stuff that we can begin to test um, in sort of a simulated fashion rather than having to actually use data. Uh, so I wrote a module to do email. And basically what it does is uh, it will send the simulated PII data. And you can set it to do, for instance, Gmail. So it will connect to a Gmail server and actually send out via email um, a group of credit card numbers or whatever. And then also web. So another cool one would be if you wanted to post it to uh, Pastebin or uh, Wikipedia, you could test it out actually posting simulated PII data. Sorry, I'm trying to rush because we're running out of time here. So future thoughts, some other really cool stuff, host-based DLP testing. So if you imagine our corporate environment, they have host-based DLP across the environment. It may be very difficult to test in each instance, but if you were to say create a Meterpreter EXE, put it on all of them, have it run it, connect back to Metasploit, and then you could, in an automated fashion, actually test out if the data can leave that workstation and get out, for instance, via Gmail, which is a, a common way of getting it out. Uh, and then you could, using post modules, add in other exfiltration methods. So uh, if there was a new exfiltration method you wanted, you could just modify the post module, still use the PII mix-in, so it would be very short, very easy. And you could, with the client, say, here's how I was able to get data out. Here's where your host-based DLP is failing you, or your network-based DLP, wh whatever it is. Uh, then also IDS fingerprinting, which was Bandit's idea, is a really cool idea. 
Um, so you know the signatures for, I you have like known signatures for certain IDSs. Uh, and then you begin to send those signatures from a system and you can actually in a passive way fingerprint the ID IDS itself. So there's a lot of cool stuff that could be done with it and it could actually bring a lot of value in terms of uh, the pen testing portion. If you want to do your demos? Okay, real quick, I'm gonna try to get some demos and hopefully the demo guys are kind. Okay, uh, how, do, how does that look at the back? Do I need to increase the size? She had. Try to raise this up a little bit. Okay, so uh, right now, like I said, hopefully uh, we're going to get as many of these modules in the trunk uh, soon after. Soon afterwards, uh, if uh, we can keep Dave sober, <laughs> we're going to get this stuff. We're going to get this stuff in the trunk as soon as possible. So basically, I, I, I used some research. Ten minutes. Uh, so basically, I've been researching all over the place, and actually, one of one of our customers asked, uh, "Can we simulate Mariposa?" Uh, and and some of these things, and the the whole point of this is sometimes on your network, uh, there may be things that that are that that have been confiscated by the federal, federal agents and all that stuff, but. Many times you can go into old networks and you can see people beaconing out to all kind of crazy malware that's been retired a long time ago, but people aren't seeing it. So I think it's very, uh, for, for things like Mariposa, Zeus, and all these things, what I did is I downloaded a list of all the DNS servers historically that they've been using, and I, I went out, I basically did DNS, I actually used a vSplate module to go out and see which one still responded. And, and personally, I, I really don't care if some of these, I know some of these have been confiscated and such, but if they reply, I'm kind of wondering why are organizations not blacklisting some DNS names? So if you can, so I think that uh, you can show with this, I'm just gonna run this real quick. And it's straight out, uh, I don't know what the ISP is here, but uh, it, it, it just goes out and it starts uh, uh, resolving uh, DNS entries uh, to, to associated with Mariposa historically. And uh, what's kind of cool about this is, is this is a pretty safe thing to do on, on any network. Uh, instead of actually having to install malware on a machine and look at it, and, this, and, and you can't really do that, you wouldn't want to do that on a, a real environment, uh, you can actually just do this and, and it would simulate that traffic. It's hung up for a second here. I don't know if it's having a problem resolving something. But uh, essentially, it's pretty, it's dead simple. You put an array of known bad stuff and you just do DNS queries on it. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, another thing I want to show you real quick is uh, the, the Web PI uh, module. Well, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm good. Hold on a second. So that's set, setting me up a listener on that, that uh, IP address there. I'll just go to it in a browser. And so basically it generates a, a list, uh, and this is a thousand pages of uh, data that looks to be credit cards, CVV, uh, social, and all kind of other stuff. And right here it says metasplay.org here, but if you're, if you're concerned with if any kind of emails or anything else leaking out of your organization, you can easily replain, uh, replace that. And with a little bit of Ruby knowledge, you can actually go in and edit this to be relevant to your organization. Now I'm thinking this could be, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, like if you're a bank, you know, if you have credit card numbers, you can, you, uh, if you have your, these four, these first couple of digits here, 
usually indicate what kind of bank it is. So if I was a bank, I would put fake stuff there and see and, see, and let, it, let it leak out of the network to see if my systems are, are seeing it. Or if you're a medical institution and you have medical information, you can actually do that. Now, um, anytime this refresh, it generates a, I didn't do the auto refresh thing. So you can actually do something because every 15 seconds it's going to generate a thousand entries. So over time you can actually calculate and you can actually change this to say, if you're a pen tester like Will said, hey look, I, I, I put a server on your network and I leaked all this data out. I, I took all this, this information out. Did you actually see any of that data? You're not leaking real data out, but you're just seeing if uh, the organization even has the visibility. Do they have their, their monitoring devices in the right place? And uh, one of the other things is uh, the, the next one I'm going to show you real quick uh, is uh, I've actually been, been uh, actually playing around with the, with the snort rules. What's up, guys, over there? My source fire guys in the house. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to just do the front page. So, uh, in, in, a, in a case, you, it, there's not a lot of environments that have all their snort rules turned on, but every once in a while there's environments that, like, you might want this rule, this rule, and this rule. So, I was saying, in those particular cases, what you want to do is you want to be able to send information to those particular servers that you're concerned about and actually see. So, I actually looked in. Uh, looked in the VR, VRT uh, rules and uh, options. And I'm actually using a scanner uh, mix in. In the scanner mix in, you can actually send it to several devices. So if you have a VLAN of, of like, you know, a class C and you want to actually be able to send, send stuff to that whole entire class C, you can put in a range or you can put in a singular IP address. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set our host to metasploit.com. And, uh, and I can run this, and what it does is just does HTTP requests that should generate mo should generate some some of these uh, these rules. Now I haven't vetted it all every one of these work yet, but I know I played around with Snort a little bit, and it definitely does trigger some of the rules. So if you're actually interested in some of these things going to to your servers, you could do it. Now this is not intended to try to flood Snort or blind operators or anything. It's just an attempt to make pe to be able to point particular rules, a, a rule, I mean what I call attributes, towards certain different uh, assets and be able to see if you actually uh, have your, your uh, IDS configured properly. Uh, so I think that uh, we're at the end now. And uh, I appreciate everyone for coming. Thank you very much.